a shoulder girdle exam need not be tedious and one that the patient has to go into multiple positions for. There's a nice, comfortable, efficient position the patient can get into on sideline, and we can now examine the thoracic spine, CT junction, scapulothoracic region, AC joint, SC joint, and glenohumeral joint, looking at joint plane motions, ligament stress tests, and be able to get a fairly good idea of just what might be the contributing factors of why the person has problems with the shoulder girdle. We're not going to be including neurovas neurovascular structures and its influence on the shoulder, but that can be included if we wanted to at another time. I'm going to start by cradling the individual shoulder girdle with my hand. And I'm going to take my free hand and I'm going to come into the thoracic spine around T7, T8. I'm going to first do some nice gentle glides into the thorax, ex ex uh, accentuating extension of the mid-thoracic region. I can do this bilaterally. If I find an area that feels stiff, I can come in and see whether or not that side is, has a unilateral restriction versus a bilateral restriction. I can come up into the cervical thoracic region, examine the same way in the cervical thoracic region, looking for unilateral problems or a bilateral restriction at C7, T1, T1, T2. I can now come into the scapula thoracic region get a sense of how well the scapula moves, how well we can elevate and, and to depress, to protract, retract, do some combined movements of protraction, elevation, retraction, depression, elevation, retraction, and depression, protraction. From here, we can then go into the movements of the clavicle in looking at the anterior and posterior rotation. And I can do this from either the front or the back side. It's usually easier from the back, though. And I can come in, as with a inspiratory phase movement, where the clavicle is, uh, will posteriorly rotate as the scapula depresses and retracts. I can ask the individual to take a breath in and get a sense of the mobility. And then I can let the air out and then protract and it goes into the clavicle anteriorly rotate. And then we can look at the AC joint relative to its linear glides. Again, remember we have a curved surface here. I'm going to fix the clavicle anteriorly, perhaps grasp the acromion and the spine of the scapula. And I'm going to anterior and posteriorly rotate the clavicle on the acromion with a fixed clavicle as I mobilize the acromion versus coming to the posterior aspect of the acromion, uh, of, the scap of the clavicle and grasping the acromion, and now moving the acromion posteriorly, which is a relative anterior glide of the clavicle on the scapula. Next, we can come in and look at the SC joint. Again, looking at the glide of the SC joint. We looked at the SC joint relative to the angular motions with our scapular mobility. If we look at a movement, if we find a restriction, we can look to see whether it's an articular problem by coming into the medial side of the scapula thoracic uh, SC joint and go inferior and laterally and see whether or not we have restriction of the joint with elevation or with depression. We can come and do superior and medial on the SC joint. Examining the SC joint we can look for, we've looked at our angular motions already as we looked at the scapular movements. If we want to look at the joint play with elevation, we have the movement of the SC joint inferiorly and laterally. So we can come onto the joint line and glide and get a sense of whether or not there's play there and check the end feel. And then for depression, we'd be looking for superior and medial play here and getting a sense of that SC joint, whether it's moving well or not. From here, we can now move into the glenohumeral joint. And at the glenohumeral joint, we can do a number of things. We can look for the uh, joint play in terms of anterior-posterior play. It's important to be able to fix the scapula. I usually come in with my stomach. and will fix the back of the scapula, hold the, glen the uh, humeral head, and I want to get a sense of how the humeral head moves posteriorly 
and anteriorly in the fossa and also get a sense also you're going to have to play with this a little bit as the again the, the surface of the of the uh, fossa is, is not flat it's not planar but it's got curve to it so we have to go with the glide of the joint as we move posteriorly and anteriorly again these can be nice mobilization techniques as well we can then come in under the arm and we can look at inferior glide, again fixing the scapula, and just gliding the humeral head inferiorly to get a sense of joint play here. This again can be a nice area for treatment and even for manipulation in that area as we choose. Finally, we can examine the ligaments of the glenohumeral joint. This is based on work done by Cliff Fowler in looking at and reviewing the research that was done by uh, O'Brien back in the early 90s where they were looking at primary and secondary restraints of the glenohumeral joints and we, they found that certain positions that Cliff was able to reproduce of the movements of the arm in neutral, in abduction, in flexion and extension would again reproduce a lot of what was identified in that study in being able to look at the primary and secondary restraints. So with the arm in a neutral position if we then move the humerus in a medially rotated position, this would be stressing the superior and middle part of the posterior capsule as primary and secondary restraints. If we take the arm and move the arm into a laterally rotated position, this would be stressing the superior and middle uh, anterior glenohumeral ligaments. If we now take the arm into a, an abducted position, and again, medially rotate the arm from the humerus. We're now going to be stressing the posterior band of the inferior uh, glenohumeral ligaments, as well as the coracohumeral ligament. If we laterally rotate, we're going to be stressing the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and the coracohumeral ligament as well. If we now take the arm into flexion and we immediately rotate the arm in this position, we're going to be stressing the middle part of the posterior capsule and the coracohumeral ligament. And with lateral rotation, we're going to be getting the superior, middle, and anterior inferior glenohumeral ligaments, as well as the coracohumeral ligament. And finally, in extension, we're going to, with medial rotation, we're going to be getting the posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and the coracohumeral ligament. And with lateral rotation, we're going to be getting the superior band and the middle band of the anterior glenohumeral ligament.